Hi, I'm Jamie. This is Dead Dodge Garage, and this is the Toolbox Charger. And if you've been around long enough to know why it's called that, let me know where to mail your cookie. This original 318 powered gold 1973 Dodge Charger was one of my earliest projects for the channel. I had big plans of putting a blown 440 here under the hood and creating my own real life Roger Dodger tribute. As is my way with all things, I had every intention of building this car really cheaply. The thing had been kind of stripped down and half primered, had some crappy bodywork from a previous owner. It was one of those classic abandoned projects. It just needed some help. I kind of just started throwing it together and I hit it with some bomb can semi-flat black, which I love. It looked kind of awesome. Unfortunately, this whole 68 Charger thing happened and suddenly the 73 Charger and many other projects around here were surplus. So almost two years ago now, I did something I called the Dead Dodge Garage Sale where I sold all kinds of things. This Charger was one of those things. For some reason, I agreed to help the new owner, Tracy, finish it. Probably shouldn't have done that. Tracy had a very different vision for this car. He wanted to make it nice. And to that end, he's put a lot of money into it. The whole interior is now brand new. All of the glass is brand new. And of course the car got painted in this fantastic color. It's not an amazing paint job. It's pretty decent. It's covered in a fine layer of dust right now. You know, we're not building a show car here. We're building a driver. This is gonna be a great driver. I did actually do a video on this car when I came back from paint. I haven't done anything since then, and there are a lot of reasons for that. The main reason is we only work on it for about a half a day at a time. You know, little projects like replacing all the brake lines, the front end overhaul, there were a few days in that, the wiring, which is also all brand new from M&H. Lots of fine little details here, but it's been spread over the course of like a year and a half. Yeah, it's been long enough since we put these new rotors on that they've already rusted over. It's kind of damp in here sometimes. It's horrible. Anyway, today, at long last, I thought I'd give you an update, show you where the car's at, and then maybe work on it, because I'd like it to leave. There are tons and tons of nice little details. And spider webs? Anyway, brand new side markers, for example. The rear end is actually just about wrapped up. That is the factory bumper with a nice new set of taillight lenses inside cleaned up original bezels. It's mounted on 71.2 rear bumper brackets. That way the bumper is pulled into the body and it looks so much better. In the factory 73.4 configuration, the bumper sticks out to like here, and then there's a strip of plastic that fills in the gap. It's just terrible. If you're restoring one of these 73 or four cars, I can't stress enough how much this improves things. You should really consider pulling the bumper in. It just cleans it up so much. It takes a lot of the malaise out of the car, you know? We also got a rear valence with the dual cutouts for the exhaust, and we will be putting the awesome, super cool, rifled, rocket-looking taillight tips on this car. They're like one of the best things about 70s chargers, so yeah, that wasn't up for debate. I mentioned the front end. It was treated to everything, basically. New control arm bushings, ball joints, tie rod ends. We also installed a set of the polyurethane uh, subframe mount bushings. Of course, with one glance, you can tell I've got another day of work up here. Zerk fittings, cotter pins, sleeves for the tie rods, eyeballing the alignment, you know, connecting the brake hoses. That might be a nice idea. We did spray a quick coat of undercoating and some strategic areas of semi-flat black, and it's gonna look good. Not amazing, but good. The original brake booster came in pieces and the original brake proportioning valve looked just terrible. So here's a pro tip. Grab one of these boosters and two bolt master cylinder with prop valve kits. These things are great. We put one on our Coronet station wagon and that thing has the best brakes of anything in the fleet. I can't recommend it enough. Yeah, it doesn't look quite right. If you're doing a nut and bolt restoration that has to be 100% perfect, don't do it. But if you're building yourself a driver, this is the way to go. These isolated suspension setups use a rag joint, much like the C-body cars, full-size Chrysler Bronx. It was in pieces when I got here. Yeah, so we got a new one. We are missing the little metal tie straps that go across from bolt to bolt. That's a good thing to have in case it breaks again. I think I'm gonna make some. As mentioned, this was an original 318 car. It would have had the basic gauges, basic steering wheel, column shifter, and all of that. I installed this set of rally gauges with the matching wiring from M&H. We converted the column to a floor shift model and installed this reproduction tough wheel. I really like that look. The car came with these bucket seats, which of course were recovered with factory style covers. 
They're beautiful. We're converting to a floor shifter. We're not using a factory one. We're using one of these B&M units and that'll be fine. Personally, I think if it was up to me, I would have put a factory console in here, but then we would have had to chase down all those parts too. This is way too fancy. Oh yeah, I forgot. We did one of these fancy custom auto sound radios that has Bluetooth and an aux cable. At least I think it has Bluetooth. This is an original air conditioned car. We reinstalled the AC box, but we're not planning to use the AC section. Either way, I need to make all this work. I'm not sure it's going to, so we may be on the lookout for some new AC heat controls. There's some speakers back there. Don't forget the shiny new black headliner. Oh, we still need a dome light lens. I don't remember him getting a new rear view mirror, but that must be reproduction. It's beautiful. Yeah, there are reproduction parts sprinkled everywhere in this car. Shiny new seat belts, sill plates, gaskets, anything he could get his hands on, really. Oh, note to self, middle window rubbers. There's still a mountain of parts here, so it's entirely possible there are rubbers in there. I have no idea what's left, honestly. Oh, new throttle cable. I should install that. Here's the 440 that's going in the charger. Do us all a favor and don't notice how crappy the paint is. It was cold and I was in a hurry and out of paint. I totally forgot, but I also did a video about my original plan for this engine. It was a Marine 440. Well, technically it was out of a sea body. Then it was converted and put in a boat and now it's going in a charger. Anyway, it ended up not being quite the budget thing I thought it would be. We had to bore this engine to 60 over. It was already at 30 and the bores looked terrible. So it got new pistons, balance job, you know, basic stuff. Oh, I also did a video on these cylinder heads. They got a basic port job, set of springs. I blocked the heat crossover. Nothing fancy, but I think they're gonna work pretty well. This engine was already broken in successfully on the run stand at Rocket. So it's pretty much good to go. I did have to install those springs. I broke it in with some stock ones and then clean the thing up and paint it. I wish it had turned out a little bit better, but Tracy's not worried and neither am I. Did I mention this thing is a driver? Despite my best intentions, we did end up with a couple grand wrapped up in this engine. That's still pretty reasonable, all things considered, but it wasn't quite the budget deal I had hoped for. You'll notice here it's got Schumacher conversion mounts bolted onto it. These are really nice. It's a couple hundred bucks well spent. One thing I wasn't aware of in these small block to big block swaps is that you actually have to cut down the ear on the driver's side stand there. Now I've done this a couple times in the past, uh, poorly. When did that break? I'm gonna try and do a better job this time. So with the engine basically ready, I had to do another fun little project, shift kit in the big block 727. Now this was the first shift kit I'd ever done and for that reason I chose not to do a video. It wasn't that hard, you know, as long as you can read, follow instructions, maybe it is hard. Anyway, I think it's gonna work out well. This transmission had been rebuilt already. It looked pretty clean in there. I did adjust the bands, install the shift kit, delete the springs that the instructions said to delete, and put on this fancy screen filter. It's pretty much ready to go. I just need to get the right bolts to get this aluminum pan on. Here's our Hughes converter to go behind this 440 with its ridiculous thumper camshaft. Honestly, it probably could have had an even higher stall judging by the cam specs, but this seemed like a good compromise. It was available, in stock, affordable enough, and it'll be better than the stock piece, that's for sure. Behind that engine and torque flight, we still have this, an eight and a quarter with a two seven gear. That's not gonna fly. So we sourced this eight and three quarter housing that's correct for a 71 or two charger. We'll be cleaning that up, building a center section for it. We'll probably change to the older style um, springs and plates. Everything to match this unit like we did in the Petty Blue Charger at Rocket. That's gonna be a someday project. For now, it'll be driving around with the eight and a quarter, but this will improve things substantially. I think we're gonna go with the 355 gear. So that's basically where we're at. We've got a shiny fresh charger that's just about ready for a drivetrain. There are exactly four projects that need to happen before I can install it. So let's see about that. Number one, as mentioned, this perch. I'll drill a hole, I'll cut those ears off the top, and we'll be happy. Number two, that brake line connection. I need to change one fitting, connect that up, and then we'll put fluid in the brakes finally. Okay, side note to that, I still need to do the rear left brake for some reason, and then connect the lines. Number three is that rag joint, and finally the whole transmission pan bolt thing. And then we can bolt this thing on the back of the engine and we're ready to party. So we'll start here with the part I wanna do the least. According to the destructions, you're gonna pilot the hole that you're gonna drill here 
11 sixteenths of an inch straight down from the center of that dip. 11 sixteenths looks something like that. Nice. Drill a hole, size that hole up to, I believe it's 9 sixteenths. Then cut the ears off of the top and they show a nice gradual curve that looks something like this. Sure. Now, sometimes you have oil pump clearance issues. You might have to take a bunch more of that off. It might even hit here. So that's something to be aware of as you're installing your engine. It might have to come back out. If you're gonna put a paint dot, maybe like hit it. All my drill bits are garbage. Yay. You wanna see me break a brand new drill bit? Kinda. Look at that. Big boy chips. You know, I have to go all the way to 9 16 and there's no 9 16 bit in here. It's better than the last one I did, I'll tell you that. Nice. Okay, here goes wrists. Whee! That shouldn't happen. Oh, hey. All right. I don't have 9 16 but I have whatever this is and the bolt fits fine, so. Now we gotta do the backside. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, that's just too easy. <sighs> Was I supposed to break a brand new half inch bit? step put the fitting on first yay it's shiny and new but it doesn't fit for crap these bolts actually have safety wire holes so i came up with this crazy contraption it wraps around this on both sides and then goes through those bolts i think it might do something all right i think everything in the engine compartment's done but of course predictably something else had to break so now i'm doing this it's the next day and I'm doing transmission stuff. Got the pan installed with these aftermarket bolts. I tightened the drain plug because of course it wasn't tight already. Now I'm working on speedometer gear. Now I've already found the one I need. It's a 34 tooth, also green. The way I found that was by looking online at a speedometer gear chart. All you need to know is your rear tire height, which you can get by plugging your tire size into a tire height calculator, also readily available online. And you need to know your rear gear ratio. We're going to be changing these gears to 355s when we upgrade to the eight and three quarter. So I'm going to set it up for that now. I'm missing the speedometer drive itself and the hardware. Right. Uh, come on. That's a problem easily solved in my yard here. I guess a more accurate name for this would be a speedometer drive adapter or speedometer drive housing, something like that. Anyway, it's this chunk of aluminum that pops in the hole in the tail shaft. It's got an O-ring and the gear assembly sits in it like that. This one has a 38 currently. The 34 will drop right in. They're all the same. There's one very important detail when setting this up. Because there are a bunch of different gears that go in the same housing with different numbers of teeth, but those teeth must be the same size, that means the gears themselves have to change in size. You can see here that the housing is asymmetrical. It's kind of like a cam. You install this thing and then you line up one of the number ranges based on whichever gear you selected, in my case, 32 to 38. That line with that dot. <clears throat> Perfect. The correct hold down clamp actually slots into this housing as well, ensuring that it's aligned correctly and locked in place. Of course, if you're a Mopar nut job like me, you hoard piles of these things. You just never know. I also need a neutral safety switch, if for no other reason than to plug the hole. Now it's time for the fun part. 
Installing the torque converter. Colloquially known as stacking, this is the process of getting all the splines and the pump teeth engaged with this converter, making sure that it's all the way inside the bell housing so it won't get screwed up when we bolt the transmission on the back of the engine. First, I'm gonna dump in some transmission fluid. I like to use Type F. You can use whatever you want, I guess, but Type F has worked well for me. This is a slow and very annoying process. We're not gonna get a whole bunch of fluid in there. Maybe the whole quart if I'm patient enough. This involves a bit of rocking and angling the converter. Now these converters hold a lot of fluid. It varies, but you know, four to even like eight quarts in larger ones. You're never gonna fill it all the way like this here on the bench. You just wanna get something in there so it's not dry. You'll definitely make a horrible mess. That's part of it. Let's see if I can pull this off on camera. Probably not. Sometimes they just go right in. Sometimes they're really challenging. Oh, and I got that whole quart of fluid in there. I could keep going, but remember that thing about not having patience? Okay, so we're engaging two sets of splines and a set of teeth. One of them will probably just pop right in, that one. Now this involves a good bit of spinning and wiggling. Usually I'd blame this on the camera being on, but the truth is, it's always really annoying and dumb. As far as I know, there's no way to just magically line it up. It always involves this. The thing is, if you don't know that, and you just get it to this point and try to install it, look how far it's sticking out of the transmission. You're gonna jam it into the crankshaft and flex plate, and that's not gonna be good. You'll ruin your front pump, most likely. And you might crack your bell housing, which is always fun. Yes, that's experience speaking. Come on. Sometimes, I just pop it off and start again and it magically goes. One. Two, three. Three, is that three? I think that's it. Look how far that is in there now. Yeah, that's good. When it's installed, your converter should look something like this. If it doesn't, uh, it's probably not in all the way. And if you have any doubts about that, you might measure from this surface to one of those pads, maybe using like a straight edge or a block or something, and then measure from the back of the block to the bolting surface of the flex plate. Compare the two. You should have extra room. If you don't, uh, keep trying. Speaking of flex plates, this is your chance to mark that. The bolt pattern on it is asymmetrical, and so it's only going to line up one way. I have a bunch of these, some of them better than others. Interestingly, this one uses the small pattern. I do have one of these fancy 440 source solid flex plates with all the different bolt patterns. I'm not gonna use that, but I might need it someday. Now when I say asymmetrical bolt pattern, this is what I mean. In this position, all four bolt holes line up perfectly. In this position, they don't. You can see there's an offset bolt, so you need to get it this way. Really easy way to make sure you can line it right up when you put the engine and transmission together. And that's a paint mark on one ear. There we go. That'll be easy to spot underneath the car and really hard to mess up. Brakes, done. Well, assembled anyway, not bled. Did I film that? No. The wheels are back on the car. It looks awesome. I want those on there just in case I knock it off the jack stands while I'm installing the drivetrain. And yes, that's happened before, kind of. Speaking of drivetrain, I've got the engine dangling and I'm working on connecting it to the transmission. Funny story, I learned something today. How I didn't know this, I don't know. I thought these flex plates were the same, big and small block. They're almost the same, except for those two bolt holes. I can see no other reason why they wouldn't be interchangeable. The depth seems the same. The bolt pattern for the converter is the same. The size is otherwise the same. The register, no idea. It makes no sense, but they are big block and small block specific. So I had to dig into the pile again and find this one. Now I need flex plate and torque converter bolts. Luckily, I have some. Now, here's a whole set in a bag. That'll work. Man, that's a cool car. 
Looks like it's doing a wheelie. Flex plate bolts get torqued to 60 foot pounds and Loctite's always a good idea. I've never made it an engine and transmission on the bench before. It's almost too easy. It'd be a lot easier if I had some help, but that's fine. Hey, here's what your converter and flex plate should look like. It should be a good gap, like a quarter inch or something. And the converter should move. Someone somewhere is freaking out about me using a lift plate on an aluminum intake right now. Don't worry, it can't kill you through the camera. I forgot this is like the world's worst cherry picker. Barely rolls. You know, full big block drivetrain, not exactly light, but I made it here. Nice. I'm out of time for tonight, but uh, I think that 440 is going in that charger tomorrow. Remind me to find the rest of the bell housing bolts. That would be good. Oh, good. It's probably not gonna lift this thing high enough now. And I have a puddle to clean. Yeah, it's gonna be close. I guess I'll put the nose on the ground. I'm gonna leave the rear jacked up. A commenter said that would help. Oh, this is gonna be fun. Should go though. I'm gonna try not to park it on the fender, but just in case. Nobody breathe. Okay, all right, there you go. Usually it's ideal to have help with this, but I don't. Did I mention these casters are terrible? I think it's okay. Hey, let me know when it's far enough in to go down, would you? Yeah, it's gonna be close. Does anyone remember that time I dropped a slant six on a Barracuda? I'm gonna try not to do that again today. I'm gonna have to rig something up for the hood. It should fit. Woo! Easy. Yeah, if someone would come hold the hood, that'd be great. Cause you know big blocks are heavy? Well, they are. Yeah, this is where you need a spotter. Beautiful. Haven't ruined anything yet. I should put a blankie on that. Things are gonna get interesting in a minute here. We're getting places, but we're gonna run out of rearward movement. I need more angle on the engine. I could have gone from the front hole, but then as you can see, there's no way I ever would have gotten the transmission swung in there by myself. So now I'm gonna take a ratchet strap, wrap it around the balancer and gently lift the front of the motor. That should fix the attack angle here. It should go right in, maybe. Yeah, something like that. And don't forget the hat on its head. Now we got plenty of room to go down. Uh -huh. Yeah, huh? <laughs> you really should have the hood off to do this, but uh, that's not an option. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, okay. <clears throat> Whee! There we go. And you know, the factory would have installed the engine from underneath with the whole suspension. And that was my plan for this car, but unfortunately it didn't really work out that way and the suspension's already done. Oh, there we go. Nice. I've done many, many drivetrain installs through the top with the hood in place, just like this. So don't let anyone tell you it can't be done. It's definitely not preferable though. Okay, now the pan is clear. So we'll drop it a bit. I'll carefully release that strap and then we'll get ready to set a jack under the transmission and swing this thing vertical. I'm gonna have to dodge that torsion bar cross member under there and that is gonna be tricky. Down periscope. Come on. Here's what I'm talking about in the back. The cross member that the torsion bars anchor in in the 73 plus B body. That tail housing needs to go up over that by like a few inches, so you gotta be careful. I'm gonna jack up the transmission now because it's trying to sit on the steering. And this is a bit of a dance too. You don't wanna get this too high, but you need to get it high enough. And then you wanna swing your jack handle in there and hopefully your jack will roll that way with no resistance as you send the engine home. It's actually going pretty well, right? Yeah, well, give it a minute because next I have to get headers installed. This is the finest ratchet strap Harbor Freight had, so I'm sure this will be fine. Whee! Oh boy. Hey, uh, just so you know, if you're doing this with a big block especially, wiper motor and brake booster are going to become interference items very quickly. Oh yeah, ran right into it. Yep. Yep. It's really close to not working. 
Looking good. The pinch weld there in the floor and firewall seam is gonna be your biggest obstacle. I might allegedly be uh, massaging that right at the moment. As you set the engine down to try and clear that, the K-frame is gonna become an obstacle. Delicate balance. You might slip some cardboard in there. That can help. Header install. I turned the camera off because I didn't want you to hear the inevitable string of horrible profanity. And then it just kind of slipped right in there from underneath. Of course, this is the easier side, the passenger side. We'll see how the driver's side goes, I guess. Now that I don't believe. With the engine dangling in this position, which is still quite a good ways out, that header also went right home. I've just got one bolt each started to kind of hang them there. As the engine now goes home, I'm gonna have to maneuver them a little bit and I'll try to get a rear bolt in as well. Did I drop it all the way down to the frame on accident on final approach? Maybe, but I'd never admit to that. Passenger side mount through bolt is in. Now we get to work the driver's side into position from underneath, which is gonna be tons and tons of fun. Look, a dent. I didn't do that. The amount of room I've got to work with here for the driver's side through bolt hardware, comical. I got the nut in there, but I did have to forgo the lock washer. With that installed, there is not enough room to start that nut straight. Just crazy. Oh yeah, the direction said to trim this surface, which I did, but I should have trimmed it lower. It's gonna be tricky to get a wrench to that to hold it while I tighten the bolt. It's in there though, and it fits. Yay. All right, starting to get the engine actually aligned. I'll tighten all the mount bolts down. Then of course I do still need to do header gaskets and then all of the stuff that's missing here. Crazy enough, set across the inner fenders, this level is actually level. So what I'll do is measure down to the valve covers and make sure it's close. My eye says it's really close where it's at, but the passenger side might be a hair low. Before I snug all that mount stuff down up front, I'm getting the transmission cross member bolted in, the mount bolted down, and we'll be good to go here. That'll help hold everything where it's supposed to be. But first, time for a burrito. I didn't find a new mount, but I did find a full complement of factory mount hardware including those rectangular shims. The transmission is firmly bolted in place. The 440 is in the charger, like actually in, bolted down and everything. I'd love to stand here and bask in this glorious moment, but now I've got another mail truck to work on. So I guess we'll revisit this like tomorrow, probably. Well, it's like days later. That's not even the same mail truck. Time to get back to the charger. <clears throat> we have one medium large problem. The driver's side header wants to live on the rag joint, the brand new rag joint that I just installed. Not great. Now these headers are listed as fitting 71 to 74 B bodies. Then sure, that's true, but if you've got one of these 73 fours, the rag joint's just in that header pipe. And they didn't mention that, of course. Why would they? I don't know why the nose of these late B bodies is so long, but seriously, there is almost enough room for a second 440 right there. Rimflex header gaskets. Pretty much the only header gasket, if you ask me. Edelbrock 750. Ordered so long ago, I didn't even know the AVS-2 existed yet. It's the following week, and some things have happened. The battery's sitting in place, for example. That's just your standard Group 24. The steering column is out. It was really challenging to get that pin to move, but once it moved, it basically popped right off. I've moved on to things underneath the car. I'm going to install the flanges for the exhaust guy, and I need to get the transmission cooling lines in. Probably should have done those when the engine was still loose because it doesn't seem like they're going to want to slide through their little spot. Then the starter needs to go in, the shifter cable, the kick down, etc. The fuel tank is done. Tracy had already finished it once with new lines and hardware and what have you. But we had to remove it again to get the filler neck installed. Turns out it's like impossible to install it through the top with the tank in place. There's a bit of an angle problem. We still need to insert a bolt there, but otherwise the filler neck's ready to go and we can dump some gas in this thing. There's nothing quite like taking apart new stuff that you just put together. Water pump housing. It's all cleaned up, the new pump is installed, and we removed a vacuum switch and the other heater nipple, which we won't be using. I insisted on using this factory thermostat housing. I've talked before about how terrible those aftermarket chrome units are. Yeah, I'm not putting those on anything. As if all that happening at once wasn't enough, I'm digging in the parts pile. I've found the ignition components I need to install and so much more. Like all of these things. I've been planning for a while to do a video on all of the electronic gizmos under the hood of your classic Mopar. Most of them are right here. 
the ignition control module, the voltage regulator, the ballast resistor, and the all-important starter relay, which also acts as a power connection point from battery to inside the car. Factory battery cable would have had this trigger wire for the starter built in, but this one doesn't, so I'm making it. Problem solving with a hammer. Delightful smells. Nice. Not so nice, but functional. Torsion bar. Column body. Well, I've been working on this thing all day. Kind of a wild ride. But the headers are in and torqued. And thanks to all the hammer beating, they actually don't hit anything. I made a good bit of room there for the rag joint, so the factory column is actually gonna work just fine. I heat wrapped the tube and I heat wrapped the joint as well. So hopefully that's enough. Now this will come as a shock, but the big Chrysler starter did not want to fit in there, like at all. I basically couldn't install it with the header and that's normally what you have to do. You need them both loose and you pass them up together. I even had the column out of the way. Didn't help at all. Thankfully I had one of these handy, so I sacrificed it for the cause. And there it is, installed, torqued, wired. Notice here, the main positive is very close to the block on the big block. You gotta be careful there. Make sure that thing's tight and it's not gonna like rattle free and short out on everything. It should probably have a rubber boot on it, but I don't have one. Also notice the heat wrap for the cable going in there. With the mini starter, it actually points a different direction and it's not as bad of a fit with the header as with the old school starter. It's gonna be fine, but I left the blanket on there anyway. I dented this outside tube to clear the torsion bar. I should have dented it more. They're not touching, but they are very, very close. Something tells me that's gonna be horrible and rattly, so I'm gonna to have to work on that a bit. But the cool thing is this header actually fits out with the engine bolted to the K-frame. With the mini starter, it's doable. I think for the old school starter, we would have had to raise the engine. Especially after denting this thing around the power steering box, it's now an easy install, and that's really cool. Oh, remind me to cotter pin all the steering. It's actually just sitting together. I need to do that soon. This car might actually drive. Working through all kinds of things, I found a drive shaft that fits. It happens to be labeled 71 Dodge Challenger 318 AT. Of course, the Challenger is a shorter wheelbase than this, but then it would have also had a 904 transmission. Somehow it magically had the larger yoke for a 727, and it fits this car almost perfectly. Actually, it's a hair short, but since we're gonna change the axle for an eight and three quarter, which requires a slightly shorter drive shaft, I think it's gonna be absolutely perfect. These welded mufflers are staying. We're just gonna hook them up to the new headers and we're gonna put the awesome rifled rocket tips on there. Probably need some zip ties to get it to the exhaust shop. The number of little things that need done here, kind of insane. I'm gonna try not to think about that and just keep working through stuff. Currently, electrical system things. I made up a starter trigger wire that goes from the relay down to the starter. You see, we're using a generic positive cable. It doesn't have the relay feed or the starter trigger built in, so I'm having to add those. Because I'm kind of fancy, you know, not really fancy, but a little fancy, I'm joining them together and wrapping them like a factory cable would be. So at least it'll look kind of sort of right. Well, it's the end of day, day is this, four? I don't even know. We have so many things we didn't have. Transmission cooling lines, for example. Spark plugs, and they're even tight. Tracy's got the water pump in some orange. It might need another coat, but it looks better than the engine does. Mmm, spray paint. Oh, there's a lot left to do here, and it's time to go buy burritos, but just real fast. Nice. <laughs> nice. I can't test anything else because we don't have a column or a brake light switch or a headlight switch. But nothing's on fire and I'm calling that a win. Oh yeah, Tracy got a mirror put on. Very shiny. We're getting places. Slowly. All right, I goofed up a little bit. Here's the aluminum radiator Tracy bought for the charger. I swear I looked in the box and saw the lower hose on that side, so I thought we needed this, the later style water pump housing. No, we need the early one, like the same one that's on my charger. That's a problem because we've already got this later style housing with a new pump, thermostat, nice water neck, all new, ready to go. I think I have an older style one somewhere, but I also have this. This is the shiny, almost brand new 26 inch aluminum radiator that I bought for the 69 charger in Montana from Flying M Speed and Aeromotive. He just happened to have it new in a box and it almost fit 
I had to modify it a little bit, but it worked. That radiator has like 45 miles on it. It's like new, except where I had to beat it and trim it. Unfortunately, the shroud that he bought doesn't fit on that radiator. That's okay. It doesn't fit on this one either. It doesn't line up with the bolt holes and it hits the tanks. One of the holes for the mounting bolts on my radiator doesn't line up and I'll have to modify that bracket even more, but that's fine. This one's worse and this one doesn't have enough side bracket to drill a hole in. Aren't aftermarket parts fun? The only thing that's better on this one is that cooler line is farther out there, so I'll have to bend it slightly. It probably would have lined up here. Otherwise, I think we're better off with the rounded looking one. They're both triple row. They're both shiny aluminum. They're both gonna do the job really well. So now I'm putting accessories together. Crank pulley is in. We're using this really nice accessory kit. It's got all the brackets, pulleys, and bolts. Really awesome. I think that all came from Mancini, although I could be wrong. Well, that's something. Although this one doesn't fit right, so that's cool. Fuel line's hooked up. Tomorrow I'll bend up the line to the carb. Now that I've got the alternator in place and I know exactly where it needs to be. Probably make heater hoses, figure this nightmare out. Back on accessories. Lots of fun. You know, they include just about all the hardware you need. Brackets, bolts, all that. I had to add some washers here because for whatever reason, the brackets were a good bit too wide. Now I'm trying to put the pulley on, but the one thing they didn't include, a woodruff key. So I had to go find my assortment of those, find one that's the right width and modify it extensively on the bench grinder. Should be close now. Yay! Well, it's <clears throat> weeks later and I'm back working on the charger here. I've got the carburetor bolted to the intake. I've got the fuel plumbed. We've got the heater control valve mounted here. I need to make up hoses to the engine and back to the heater core. All of the components are bolted to the firewall. So in theory, this thing would run. Spark plug wires would help though. Before that could happen, transmission fluid would also be really nice. So I'm down here installing a dipstick tube. Ooh, look, a collector. You know, it's amazing. A factory dipstick tube just like goes right in and bolts down. I don't like those goofy aftermarket ones you buy on the internet. This thing's actually gonna go to an exhaust shop for this system to be connected to the new headers and for the tips to be aligned and installed, which is great. But until then, it's gonna be very loud. Header flanges, nice. I was gonna put in the speedometer cable. I swear we had a speedometer cable. I guess we don't have a speedometer cable, that sucks. I did dump in five quarts of transmission fluid on top of what I already got into the converter. I'm sure it'll take several more, but this is a good place to start. Mmm, expired granola bar. Situation update. This operation is running long. I don't even necessarily mean video runtime. I have no idea what that's looking like, but I mean in like real life time. Weeks, so many weeks. I really want to put a pin in this, you know, wrap this episode up, but I feel like we're all deserving of a triumphant success. For a nice ending, you know? I think the perfect ending would be hearing this thing run in the car. So I'm gonna do what I need to do to make that happen. There are a handful of small things that need to happen, like vacuum lines and such, but there are two major hurdles. One, I need the transmission cooling lines connected to something. Either this, with the correct fittings, or a chunk of rubber hose connecting them together. And two, spark plug wires. Of course, they're the annoying roll your own type, so I had to get the special crimper cutter thing tool from the local parts store. Now I'm gonna trim these things up and put ends on them. <sighs> <coughs> I've actually done this on the channel before. I can't remember when, last summer, I think. Anyway, I'm not gonna go through the whole process. For one thing, that time I got a bunch of good advice and I can't remember what that was. Uh, greasy. You know, I think before I was putting the boots on first, this doesn't want to go around the corner. <sighs> well, good news. I measured the first one twice and it's still too short. Getting places. Ugh, oh, can't forget this little guy. I've got the vacuum advance hooked up on ported for now. That might change, but we'll see. Well, according to my calculations, this thing's ready to fire up. And it better be because it's like past dinner time. Now recall, this engine's already been broken in on a run stand, so it'll be fine to just fire up an idle for a few seconds. 
And when I said fire up, of course, I meant pour gasoline all over everything. Oh, someone was admiring the black intake the other day. I think it's kind of cool. We do have a nice matching air cleaner to go on top. Power. Here's to loud, ridiculous noises and no puddles. Oh, that's too much timing. Here's to loud, ridiculous noises and no puddles again. <laughs> Once more, you know, for posterity. Did you know 440s are thirsty? Of course, what you want to do right before you come in late for dinner is pour gas all over yourself. Don't do that. Uh, did I leave one of the cooling lines loose? Did I leave both of the cooling lines loose? <sighs> okay, well, anyway, it runs. It runs! I would've put some fuel in the tank, but it's like impossible. Well, we'll figure that out later. For now, I'm gonna revel in the moment. Oh good, the swimming hole's filled back up. Well, I'm nothing if not consistent. Hey, what do you know? Well, I almost can't believe it, but it's all plumbed and full of coolant and looking pretty good. Hit the key, would you? Remember, it's loud. Oh, we should probably connect the battery. All right, crack the throttle. Wait, the throttle doesn't work. Okay, go. Sounds really good. Also, loud. Painfully loud. While I was buttoning things up in the engine compartment, Tracy and a friend were getting stuff done. It's got two mirrors, working door locks, the panels are all back on. It's got a power antenna for some reason. It's got a radio that works. All kinds of good stuff. Oh, that was a little insurance policy after my recent experience with that dark convertible. So far, no leaks, you know, but we'll see. Obviously, there's still stuff to button up in here, but it's looking really good. Coming up next for this thing, brakes. Brakes would be great. We could probably actually put a front bumper on it at this point, and the valence. Valance, valance, whatever. Anywho, that's all gonna have to wait for like a future installment because right now I am done. So many chargers, so little time. Hey, thank you very much for watching. And remember, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again for like two years.